five. Good afternoon and welcome to the FDA's webinar. My name is Laura and I will be your session organizer. Before I introduce our presenters, I have a few housekeeping items that I'd like to mention. Please feel free to use the question and answer box on the left-hand side of the screen to submit any questions during the duration of the presentation. Your questions will be answered at the end of each presentation. An interactive poll will appear during the presentation as well as a survey at the end of the presentation. Please be sure to complete these. Now please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Glenn McMurray, the Chair of the Law Student Division. Glenn? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I first want to start by saying thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us here. Uh, we're really excited about the Law Student Division and all of the great things it can do for our law student members, as well as just law students throughout the country generally. So we're, we're super excited that you could be here today and, and participate in, in this first of our series of webinars. You're going to hear from a lot of great speakers today, including my predecessor, Ashley Akers, who was really one of the first people to help really establish the Law Student Division, so we should give a lot of credit to her. And you're going to get a lot of beneficial information from some federal practitioners and attorneys throughout the country. So again, welcome. We're going to really start off this series by telling you a little bit more about what the Law Student Division is. The Law Student Division, in terms of its history within our Federal Bar Association, is relatively new. We started this division several years ago really with the intent of trying to serve a void that really was not represented within the organization. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Federal Bar, as this program is open to non-Federal Bar Association members, appreciate that our organization is divided into a series of chapters as well as sections and divisions. Chapters are largely structured on the basis of geography. You have certain states, cities, uh, and sometimes combined cities that share a chapter. And our sections and divisions are really divided into more specialty practice sets. So we have a younger lawyers division. We now have a law student division. We have certain sections and committees that are dedicated to certain practice areas, including admiralty law, mediation, government contracting. And so that is generally how our organization is structured. And what we really had not been servicing, at least formally, uh, several years ago was our law students. We knew many of our chapters were engaging with the local law schools and law students, but we felt that we would better serve them by formalizing that relationship and by creating the law student division. So generally, our Federal Bar Association has 18,000 members across the country in a wide variety of practice settings. Probably one of the best parts about our organization is the fact that almost, you know, a little over 10% of our members are actually members of the judiciary. Federal judges and federal magistrate judges, uh, administrative law judges, courts of appeals, so on and so forth throughout the country. And those judge judicial members really help us drive the agenda of our organization and really educate us on how we can better serve the court. Uh, we also generally on the chapter front have many chapters across the country, over 100. Uh, if, if you are unfamiliar with where there might be a chapter near you, uh, I encourage you to reach out to our organization and we'll be happy to coordinate introductions so that you can get to know the chapter and perhaps help establish a law student division at your school if you do not already have one. So the law student division, we view it as an integral part of our association and we really think it helps create burgeoning practitioners that will better serve our organization in the future. A little bit about what our law student division is intended to do is we really want to stimulate the interests of our law students in activities of our association. We want to help them conduct programs of interest and value to law students, and we want to assist them in establishing, improving, and coordinating the law student chapters in each of our chapter and circuits throughout the country. So ultimately, our goal is to help make you as law students better. We want to help you progress through your careers. We want to help you 
uh, progress through your practice, and we really honestly want to up your game. We want to make you a better attorney, or if you're not going to be necessarily a practicing attorney, our organization wants to help make you the best professional you can be with the skill set that you, you gained through your law school experience. So generally speaking, the way we do that is we do a lot of coordination nationally and with your local chapters. Almost every law student chapter has a formal host professional chapter. And the professional chapter is comprised of practicing attorneys and judges like myself who are outside of law school, but who are attempting to assist the law student chapters in some of their programming and education. Much of our law student efforts have been motivated by our judicial system truly believing that we need to start early in educating you and helping you with your practice. And so that is really what we're all about. We enhance professional growth and development, uh, and we try to promote these high standards of competence and ethical conduct, uh, and we do that through these education programs, much like what you're sitting here today. And generally speaking, we have had a pretty good success rate in trying to get meaningful programming to you, the law student member, even in these difficult times that we're dealing with in the pandemic. You know, it used to be, obviously, that we could meet in person, we could uh, enjoy uh, getting to know one over another over coffee or through a lunch experience. But now, unfortunately, we have some impediments to that effort, and we have to maneuver around uh, these new impediments but still provide you meaningful programming. And so thankfully to, to some of our administrative staff, including Laura Mulhern of the Federal Bar Association and Stacey King, our National Executive Director, we have these great resources uh, like the platform you're, you're hearing me on now that will help us deliver that message to you. So uh, before I get into some of the additional programming that, that we're really trying to do for our law student members, I do want to kind of give you a little bit of background of what we're going to be doing uh, with some of our programming today. Again, I chair the law student division nationally, and you know I'm really here as a service to you all. So I want you to feel like you can ask any question you want about the law student division and what it means to you. I can tell you from my own personal experience that the FBA has meant a great deal uh, both from a personal and professional standpoint. Um, I joined the, the Federal Bar Association relatively early on in my career. I was maybe two years out of law school, and I was part of the Dayton, Ohio chapter. And uh, as a member of the Dayton, Ohio chapter, we really were a small uh, chapter that was probably in danger of closing at one point, uh, maybe 10 to 15 members at, its, at, its, at most. So honestly, in terms of size, sometimes comparable to some of the law student chapter sizes that we see. And uh, I was trying to really find my way in my profession, and I, <laughs> I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do when I grew up, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. And so I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do and kind of where I could carve my niche as a practitioner. And uh, I joined the Federal Bar Association here locally and started participating there, and they sent me to an annual conference for my first time. And I got to meet uh, a bunch of different practitioners from across the country who were very committed to making my experience with the Federal Bar Association a success. And they were so committed that they helped me rebuild the Dayton chapter uh, to the type of chapter it is now with well over 100 members, and we do well over 10 events per year. And it is singularly probably the, one of the most rewarding organizations I've ever been a part of. Um, I can tell you that if I'm ever looking for an attorney to refer work to, it's the first resource that I go to. Um, I look to see if we have any chapter, mem uh, you know, Federal Bar Association members in that particular uh, location of the country if I need a local counsel for a case, and it's the first place that I go. And I can also tell you that um, as a young attorney going through and, and ultimately becoming a partner at a firm, I don't think I would be a partner at a firm now had it not been for the Federal Bar Association, and, and generally our members' commitment to try to make one another successful. I, I as a private practitioner, received more, more work from the Federal Bar Association than I did from any other source. People would, would think of me 
for no other reason than I was an FBA member and I participated in events and I helped out through the organization. And so it's, it's an organization that, uh, without trying to be too cliche, really cares about its members. We want to make our members successful. We want to uh, make our members happy and try to give them all the tools and resources that they need to be successful. And when we make a choice to extend um, our efforts to a group or, or organizations and groups being students in law schools, we do so with the deliberate intention that we really want to make you successful too. We want to give you the best shot when you come out of law school of finding the job you want. We want to give you the best shot coming out of law school of trying to impress that partner at the firm by having resources to help better your, your practice experience. And we really want to do that for all of you. So we have made these decisions to extend into law schools uh, with, with the deliberate intent that we are committed to making you successful and enjoying your experience within the FBA. So to the extent you are not a member and you are in, here on the call today, I really encourage you to join. It is uh, an incredible opportunity. Um, if, if, and, and as law student members, it's relatively easy to join. So to the extent you are not already a member and you are a 1L, as an example, you can, uh, for, for the fee of $50, join our organization, and that will cover your membership for the entirety of your law student experience as well as your first year as a professional member. And so, and then I will tell you in many cases, the local chapters will assist you in trying to sometimes defray that cost. Not always, but a lot of times. And so we really want you to join. We really want to give you a benefit. And so I encourage you to look into uh, that potential. Uh, currently throughout the United States, we have maybe I would say uh, 30 going on 40 actually organized chapters with many uh, other law schools expressing interest. We have um, a goal this year of establishing at least uh, 10 to 15 new chapters before 2021. I would say that we're probably 30 to 40 percent there. We're on our way. We have some, some, some schools who are really expressing interest and even in the midst of this pandemic uh, doing the work necessary to formulate those chapters. And so some of you who may be at a law school right now who don't have a chapter may be asking, hey, how, how do I create a chapter? How do we do that? Well, it's actually really easy. Um, even if you are not in a city that has a, a local professional chapter, we can still help you create a law student chapter. And really all you need is as follows. You have to have five law students who want to join and who want to become, you know, law student members of the association and who are enrolled in an accredited law school. So if you have five of your fellow law student members who want to join, please do so. Um, you need one faculty advisor and you need to create some proposed bylaws uh, and general objectives for your organization. And the good news is we have templates of those to help you in that process. And then once you get those three items together, you need to complete and submit an annual agreement form to the professional chapter that we'll assign to you, who will help mentor you. Mentor you. And then we will go through the process of, of helping you create that law student chapter. So that's, that's in essence the process. And it's relatively straightforward. It's relatively quick. And uh, from kind of people raising their hand and, and starting that process, we, we get you organized rather quickly. Um, when you become a law student chapter member, you have a couple of obligations really to obviously benefit your fellow members and try to learn a little bit about federal practice. And that's where your local professional chapters really come in. I will tell you that the instances in which there is a law school without a local professional chapter nearby is pretty rare. So usually we have pretty much every full saturation uh, in terms of being able to assign you to a professional chapter to kind of mentor that process. But when we do assign you a professional chapter to help out with your law student activities, basically that local professional chapter, which oftentimes includes your local federal judges, a lot of uh, partners at firms, and maybe some attorneys and some federal agencies, 
They work with you to provide you ideas on activities. They provide you resources to get speakers. Uh, they assist you with your interactions with our national organization. And they really try to help mentor you in your law student experience as well. A good example uh, that, that we find uh, here in my local chapter, the Dayton chapter, which I, I think does a pretty good job of this, is we on a quarterly basis will have a social mixer uh, with the uh, local law school uh, here in Dayton, Ohio, where the law student members come to our local law school or come to, the, come to a venue and interact with federal judges, interact with partners at law firms, interact with associates and and federal clerks and kind of learn a little bit more uh, in a more informal setting on what it's like to, to be a federal practitioner. And that's been really well received. And even in the midst of this pandemic, we are organizing uh, virtual mixers and virtual uh, kind of happy hours with our law student members so that they can still try to get that informal interaction uh, even though we can't necessarily all uh, go to restaurants and bars and conference rooms like we used to. So that's one of the things that we do. And we really just try to, you know, encourage those local law school members to, to really interact with the chapter, attend board meetings, and just, and just learn what they can. We're here to help you. In addition to all that, we try to also assign mentors to our, uh, to our local law student members so that they can engage in a fruitful mentorship program with somebody who's specifically dedicated to kind of, you know, work with them through their law school experience and be a, a resource for them to call and to, and to learn. So those are all things that we do through the law student, you know, division here in Dayton. Um, another thing that, that uh, the local Dayton chapter does, and the, I'm using these as examples of what happens throughout the country, is we host a lot of webinars. Um, in fact, uh, in companion with the webinars we're doing now, the local Dayton chapter is a series of webinars for our local law student members. Just talking about the ins and outs of Dayton federal practice, I know that there are, there are other professional chapters throughout the country who are doing the exact same thing with their law schools. So uh, even though it might be harder for us to see one another face-to-face, -face, we're still making it happen because we really do, again, not to be cliche, we care about you, we care about your professional advancement, and we want you to do well. So those are some of the uh, things that we do. Uh, probably one of the, the last and, and final things I'll mention to you that we also do, we talked about sections and divisions and the various practice and specialty groups that we, we have under the Federal Bar Association umbrella. What we also do is we try to give you some interaction with those organizations. Uh, and those subgroups of our of our uh, federal bar, so that you can figure out if admiralty law is something you want to entertain, or if uh, federal criminal practice is really where you'd like to be, or if you would uh, rather do business litigation or some of these other uh, subsets of federal practice. And so that's part of our goal too, to get you some of that exposure to these different practice areas, so that you kind of know what you're going into or what you may have an interest in uh, in the future. So in closing, you know, our goal here is to really help uh, give you service. This webinar, which again, lots of credit to Laura Mulhern, who, who is kind of the dedicated uh, national staff liaison to our organization. She, is, she really makes this uh, organization work uh, and really helps us out. Ashley Akers, who helped uh, create this uh, division at the very beginning. You know, we're here to help you. We're here to really try to provide you these resources. We've got a goal of creating 10 uh, to 15 new chapters, and we're on our way there, and we'd love to make you uh, be a part of that as well. So with that said, I know we've had some questions come in, and I know I'm uh, ending the, coming to the end of, of my kind of 20-minute introduction. So with that, I think I'll yield the floor to questions at this time and go from there. Thanks, Glenn. Um, that was great and really informative about the FBI and the law student division and what we can do. Um, there are some questions, um, and I will hit you with the first question. Um, we got several questions about what um, current student chapters can do as far as events. Um, are there any types of events that you see as successful in our law school student chapters and what you recommend that our students host? 
Um, yeah. Uh, so one thing that I have, have found with our law student members is a lot of law students like to have interactions with judges. And sometimes when you're trying to figure out uh, a good program that, that people will attend, uh, I know one of the questions you always have, have some concern about is, man, we can't really pay for a speaker. We can't, we can't, you know, our funding, because we're a law student organization, is limited. What can we do? And, you know, one of the events I always think is really successful um, and typically free for a law student division member is to have kind of like brown bag lunches uh, with judges. So um, there are very few chapters that I know of, uh, if at all, where the federal judges are not a part of the chapter. And so oftentimes they will reach out to the federal judges and say, hey, um, you know, Judge, uh, Judge Smith, would you please come uh, to a lunch with our law student uh, members on X date and talk to us about, uh, you know, your experience as a judge and what you like to see in young practitioners, so on and so forth. And um, my experience is that they will always, always do that. In the midst of this pandemic, you know, we are seeing uh, judges who are committed to doing that virtually. So uh, I've been... It's uh, difficult. I think we're still kind of getting that good engagement uh, and, you know, we're just uh, gearing up for the next time that we can all, you know, be in the same room under more normal circumstances. But I think those are some ideas. Um, you know, the national organization and your local chapter are also good resources for programming. Talk to them because they will give you ideas and they will often help you organize them. So, um, and, and for that matter, I'm happy to do that too. So, you know, depending on where you are, I'd be shocked if we don't have some connection uh, with the federal practice uh, bar there that we could help you out. So please use me as a resource. Um, I'm, a, I'm a partner at the law firm of Densmore & Scholl. If you type in my name and Densmore, you're going to find my contact information. And I just en encourage you to reach out to me. I'm happy to help as well. Thanks, Glenn. And um, I will add to that. Um, Gwen has mentioned to me. My name is Laura Mulhern. I am the manager of sections and divisions at SBA National. Um, please reach out to me. We have several templates that we can give you um, to promote events and host events. I have a background in event planning. Um, the, the most success I see is when law school student chapters host judge events, as Glenn said. Um, we also have several chapters that host um, federal clerkship panels um, and invite in speakers to talk about clerkships. We have several panels focusing on federal government um, jobs, such as this one and um, the next few in the series. Um, just hosting a general body meeting of your student associates at your law school um, to, you know, get more interest in the Federal Bar Association, build your membership, that is very helpful. Um, the SBA also has resources in the time of COVID to help you do these virtually. Um, we have two platforms that we use for virtual events. Um, one of them does have video. I know that is helpful um, when you're meeting in person. So reach out to me. I can get you set up with those. We have a judiciary division, and a lot of judges will host students in their courtrooms for proceedings and different things like that. Um, so please use this as a resource. Um, Glenn, would you, somebody had asked if you would just repeat your name and your contact information. I can also circulate that at the end of the presentation. Um, but if you just want to go ahead and say your name again and where you work. Oh, yeah, I, certainly. And there is one question, too, that I, I saw come through that I do I address and something that I didn't include in my slide. But real quick, my name is Glenn McMurray, and that's Glenn with one N. Uh, McMurray, M-C-M-U-R-R-Y. Um, I'm a partner at the law firm of Densmore and Scholl, which is D-I-N-S-M-O-R-E, Scholl, S-H-O-H-L. Um, I'm located in Dayton, Ohio, and um, yeah, pretty pretty easy to come across. My email address is pretty easy. It's glenn.mcmurray at densmore.com. So, uh, I'm serious. Reach out to me. I'm happy to help you out and try to, to try to figure out these things. I did see a really good question here as well from uh, an individual who wanted to know 
how they can get more involved with the national organization conferences. That's an excellent question. Um, you know, unfortunately, some of our in-person stuff is is a little bit tabled for the time being, but we are uh, we're known as an organization that really brings people together face to face, and um, we, the same is true of our law student members. You know, and so sometimes you know to get involved uh, or go to some of these conferences, usually the law student members, unless there's another reason for them to be there, they kind of coordinate with the chapter, and maybe the chapter will try to help them, you know, have some of those conference experiences. Um, but another thing that we're, we're preparing to do, part of our bylaws uh, really establishes that we have a, kind of a law student division council of sorts where we have members from each of the judicial circuits throughout the United States. Here in the coming months, we're going to really be actively trying to fill those spots. So if you are a Federal Bar Association law student member, really be uh, checking your email here in the near future because an opportunity to uh, – apply for or, or be nominated for those positions will be coming uh, available soon. And, you know, we'd love to have uh, your, your participation. Thanks, Glenn. And then I see one final question before we turn it over to our careers in the Department of Justice panel. Um, there's a question about law students um, and other students who are in master's programs at the law school. Um, so maybe an LLM program, can those students join the FBA as well? Um, yes. If you are a law student at, a, at an accredited organization um, and you, uh, even if you're in an LLM program, you can join the law student division. You're still a student, so, you know, by all means. Um, and uh, I, I think I saw as an option, is it possible for such a student to get a position with the Justice Department? Um, yeah, Justice Department positions, you know, I'm going to encourage you to talk to Ashley uh, and crew. I always joke, Ashley's smarter than me. She works for the Justice Department, actually. I do not. Uh, but, you know, I encourage you to talk to those people about some of those opportunities. They're very much coveted positions, um, but uh, I know that they're – rewarding positions and they're interesting and you know the the policy and work that you do on those is just you know uh, you know it's outstanding I know they're very rewarding so uh, I'd encourage you to kind of not to defer that you know because I have a lot of friends in the in, in justice uh, but um, you know I know Ashley's far more qualified to kind of answer some of those questions and how they work uh, but you know, uh, you know, our job in the FBA to kind of close out my my portion here today is just really try to position you for success to give you the tools to make that happen. And you're here today uh, utilizing one of those tools right now. So I really just want to thank you all again for participating. I'm really excited to be working with you all uh, as law student division members. Um, I, I really uh, can't wait uh, to work with you all to really bolster this up and make this a, a successful part of our organization. And so I look forward to uh, talking with you all in the future. I look forward to seeing you all in the future. And with that, I'll, I'll yield the floor to Ashley and her excellent panel. Great. Thanks so much, Glenn. Thanks, Glenn. Um, we will now turn over – We'll now turn over to the Careers and Department of Justice panel. Um, Ashley Akers is an FDA member. As Glenn said, she is our former chair of the Law Student Division and now serves as a board member of the YLD. Um, Ashley, take it away. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our panel today. Um, at the outset, since all of our panelists are DOJ attorneys, I'm going to give the standard intro that all of the panelists who speak today are just giving their own opinions and not the opinions of the Department of Justice. So anyways, moving to our panel, we have an awesome contingent of attorneys today with a very different practice areas, job responsibilities. They have different backgrounds prior to joining the Department of Justice and they've progressed through the DOJ in a number of different ways. So for law students, I think this panel is going to be very insightful and informative. So we'll start off with a quick introduction of our panelists. First, we have Annie Motto. Annie is a trial attorney who works for the civil division of the department in the commercial litigation branch. Annie was hired through the Attorney General's Honors Program 
which we'll talk about more in depth and is very relevant for law students as the first opportunity to become a member, or excuse me, to work for the Department of Justice. Before um, Annie joined the Department of Justice, about two years ago, she was a judicial law clerk for a couple of years at a United States District Court. And during law school, she served as a volunteer intern and a slip intern, which is the DOJ's paid internship program for the DOJ. So she has quite a bit of experience working for the DOJ on a number of fronts. And Annie graduated from Chicago Kent College of Law. Next, we have Colleen Phillips. Colleen is a trial attorney for the Civil Rights Division, and she's worked there for over six years. Colleen will give us some great perspective on career opportunities that you can take in addition to just being a trial attorney because she serves as the division's basic civil trial advocacy training faculty. And if you haven't heard of that, it's called the NAC. It's a training facility in South Carolina that in my personal opinion, is one of the best perks of working for DOJ. Um, Colleen is also uh, serves as the United States Attorney Program Coordinator. And before joining Justice, Colleen served as a child abuse and sex crimes prosecutor in Bronx County, New York. And she graduated from UC Berkeley School of Law. Third, we have Nick Cannon, who is an AUSA in the District of Puerto Rico. He is the chief of the Child Exploitation and Immigration Unit. Nick will have a chance to talk to us about transferring within the department because he used to work for the United States Attorney's Office in Washington, D.C. So we'll talk about his experience transferring to Puerto Rico. Um, prior to joining DOJ, Nick was in private practice and has practiced both civil and criminal law in the D.C. area and he graduated from the University of Richmond School of Law, and he also, like Annie, interned for DOJ during law school. And then lastly, we have Bill Rinner, who serves as the Chief of Staff and Senior Counsel in the DOJ Antitrust Division. He's been in the Antitrust Division since 2017, and he also, prior to joining DOJ, worked for the private sector. He was an antitrust litigator in D.C. at Latham and Watkins. And he clerked on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals and graduated from Yale Law School. So as you know now, we have a lot of different perspectives here. Um, so let's just get into a few of the basics. And I'm interested in how everyone got into the department and um, how about Bill? Let's start with you since you ha came from private practice and have been at the department for a few years now. Can you explain your path into DOJ? Sure, I'm happy to. And, and thanks everybody for having me. Um, I, I, I don't have notes prepared, so if I sound a little stream of consciousness, that's why. Um, so I, you know, I think my path into DOJ was uh, a little unconventional because I didn't join through the honors program or through one of the lateral um, hiring ads, which are the traditional ways that, that folks join the department. Um, I was a, you know, an, an, an eighth year antitrust litigator at a firm plugging away, um, working crazy hours like most people that age are. And um, an opportunity came up because I learned um, that uh, that uh, a gentleman named Macon Delraheem was going to be um, appointed to run the antitrust division uh, in 2017. So his nomination was um, moving ahead, and uh, I happened to have some friends in common with him, and so I was able to arrange for a meeting with him. And uh, we chatted for about an hour, and um, you know, after that he said, look, I'd love for you to come join my front office team um, at the Department of Justice Antitrust Division as a counsel to the AAG. And um, so that so that was really the, the way it happened. It was, it, I you know, had a lot of stars uh, aligned differently. I probably would still be in a firm environment. Um, but because of just a set of unique circumstances, I was very, very fortunate and blessed to be in, to be in the position that I could um, uh, that I could meet him and, and, and get hired that way. Um, you know, it involved a number of a few additional interviews. I mean, in full disclosure, I, I had to go through the appointee process, which just means you kind of get a more robust background check and 
you know, you need to have the White House give you a thumbs up. And uh, likewise, sort of up and down the department leadership offices, and that was all fine. It took a little longer than the ordinary onboarding process. I think I started, um, I met him and got quote unquote hired in, in April 2017, but I wasn't actually onboarded until after Labor Day 2017. So that's how I got there, and then, um, you know, it's just been a fun ride for the last three years. Thanks, Bill. Does your position um, end when the administration ends, or are you there until further noted? Uh, so it, it does, um, and it, it, it's, it's pretty typical for appointees to sort of be told, you know, thanks for your service, but you can go home now, <laughs> effectively. Um, that's, that's just exactly how it goes whenever there's a change in parties. Um, so, it, yeah, I mean, if I wanted to stay on, I would, I would need to apply through a competitive process to, um, to one of the position openings in, in the career ranks. Uh, and that's pretty common. A lot of folks that uh, come in uh, to, like, an appointee position uh, in the same way that I did will we'll fall in love with the division and, and, or the department and say, look, I'd, I'd love to stay here longer and do exactly that. So I've still got, you know, a little bit of time to decide if that's the route I want to take. Awesome. Now, Colleen, you came to the department working for New York. Can you tell us about your transition from uh, state to federal and sort of why you took that path? Yeah. Um, I knew after leaving law school that I wanted to be a government attorney. I am a government attorney through and through. Um, so that was the only choice for me was to be a government attorney. Um, and when I moved down from New York, uh, there was a hiring freeze in the federal government. So I first started looking for other um, criminal prosecutor jobs. And in the state of Maryland where I live, at the time, you still had to take a bar exam. Even if you were transferring down, there was no reciprocity. And I had already taken two states bar exams, and I didn't want to take a third, and I had a young child. So instead, I applied for the federal government. Um, so it wasn't a dream to work for the federal government. It was just going to be easier because I didn't have to take another bar exam. Um, and it was the best decision I ever made. Uh, working for the Department of Justice is an incredible honor. Um, and I take pride in getting to go to work every day um, to work for the DOJ. Um, but it was a huge transition. Even when you work for a state county prosecutor and then you move into the Department of Justice, they're both government agencies, but the DOJ is one facet of a much, much larger government entity. Um, and DOJ itself has many components. And we need to speak as one voice. So when we do work, even if you work for the Civil Rights Division, if your work touches on the work of the Civil Division or the Criminal Division or the Antitrust Division um, or another federal agency, I do education law, like the Education Department, you're constantly in contact to make sure that the government speaks with one voice. Um, and so that made it a very different transition to learn to incorporate all the different voices of all the different agencies. Colleen, can you, for law students, tell what the requirements are, the bar requirements for a Department of Justice attorney? Can students get barred in any state? Generally, um, and I'm going to defer entirely to our U.S. attorney, um, uh, AUSA, to respond different, but if you are working for Maine Justice, uh, traditionally you can be barred in any state. Um, and serve for uh, serve a position in the federal government. So I'm barred in New York and California, but my practice is primarily in Florida, Alabama, New Mexico, um, uh, Georgia. So I am often asking to um, to be able to make appearances in um, federal court in states that I am not barred in. Uh, the U.S. Attorney's offices, and again, I'm going to defer to my colleague, are a little different because they like you to be barred in the state where you're located. They are uh, in a, a local jurisdiction, if you will say, whereas we in Maine Justice um, go to all different jurisdictions. So we just have to have a uh, bar license in good standing in one state and from an accredited university. 
So let's hear from yeah, Nick that's, that's actually the, the same ASA. for us. Same. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so sorry. Nick, sorry about that. That's it's the same. About... Go ahead. It's the same for us. We we just um, have to maintain our our home bar um, CLE requirements yeah. and be in good standing in that particular jurisdiction. Um, obviously, it, it can help if you are familiar with the state law um, of the jurisdiction that you work in, but it's not not necessarily necessary. Right. So great, great perk for DOJ. Um, Nick, do you want to go ahead and tell us about your transition from private practice to AUSA in D.C. and then Puerto Rico? Yeah, sure. I was. I knew when I got out of law school that I wanted to uh, be a prosecutor. Um, in the homicide section of the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. And so because, obviously, um, you need to have some experience if you're not coming in through the honors program, um, I went out into private practice, joined a boutique law firm that was going to allow me right out of law school to get into court and to begin to litigate. I thought that was probably my best chance of um, separating myself from other candidates uh, in the, the D.C. office um, because you're, you're actually both in D.C. Superior Court and in Federal Court um, during your time in that office. And I knew that the caseload was heavy, so litigation experience would be a way for me to separate myself. And, and I did. I got that. I did some some trials on felony cases as a second chair, uh, tried some misdemeanor cases in Virginia and Maryland and D.C., and uh, was able to then, after two years of, of doing that, apply to the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, and was lucky enough to get an interview there. Awesome. And, Annie, we've touched on the honors program a little bit, so let's just get into that. You came to the Department of Justice through the honors program can you tell us a little bit about your experience applying, interviewing, ranking, which section you want to work for, et cetera? Sure. Um, so, yeah, as Ashley said, I came one of the, the only routes to go through um, as an entry-level attorney right out of law school. Um, the honors program hires either uh, law students directly out of law school or um, from clerkships or qualifying fellowship, fellowships. And you can do clerkships in state court or federal court. Um, there's, there's some leeway in what kind of clerkships qualify. Um, and you can defer up to three years while you clerk or um, while you're in a fellowship. And so what I did is I... Um, clerked in federal district court for two years, um, a district court in Louisiana and a district court in Illinois. And um, the hiring process is far ahead. Uh, it hires a year in advance. Um, so during my first clerkship, um, I actually applied for the following, uh, you know, hiring cycle, you know, thinking when I wanted to join the department. Um, and so I... Um, as Ashley mentioned, I interned uh, for DOJ twice during law school. I interviewed um, as a volunteer intern for the Office of Professional Responsibility. I highly encourage um, anyone who's interested in getting DOJ experience to um, go to the, you can actually find a list online of all volunteer internships. There's volunteer internships during the, every um you know, the spring semester, the fall semester, and the summer, and they're all online. Every U.S. attorney office has them. DOJ offices have them. There are tons of them. And I actually um, just took it upon myself to kind of blanket send my resume to a lot of offices that I was interested in when I was in law school because um, they have a contact, you know, email on there. And I had good luck doing that. Um, I think they liked the initiative of me just emailing them. And so that was my first experience coming out to Washington, D.C. for a summer. That was um, actually the summer of my 2L year because I, I decided later that I wanted to do government work instead of private practice work. Um, and then I actually applied to be a slip intern um, after I – so I actually was a slip intern the summer after I graduated, which sounds – strange, but you still qualify um, to do it the summer after you graduated. So while I was studying for the bar and while I took the bar, I did the paid internship program. And that was actually quite common. There were quite a few um, other interns who uh, applied through the, the paid program. That's called the SLIP 
summer law intern program. Um, two L's and three L's um, apply to, to work there. Um, and it's just a summer program, like I said, and you actually get paid. So I did both. Um, if you're interested in working for the DOJ, I highly encourage you to, you know, apply to both. The, the Obviously, the paid one is a little more competitive. Um, and for that, for my SLIP internship, I worked for the civil division. I worked in the federal programs branch. Um, that's an office that um, primarily defends the president and Congress um, to challenges against federal law. Um, and so when I applied to the honors program, as Ashley kind of alluded to, you have to rank what offices you want to apply to um, because it's, it's all within the DOJ. You know, you're applying to criminal, civil, offices within civil. Um, so you kind of have to think about what offices you're interested in working for, you know, antitrust, the tax division. Um, and so given that I had already worked for the civil division, I thought I probably would have a better chance of getting hired um, in the civil division. So that was kind of what I, I had my heart set on. Not surprising, I didn't really get, I didn't get an interview for the criminal division. I just didn't have any criminal experience. So, you know, you're gonna wanna maybe think about, you know, do I wanna go the criminal route? Do I wanna go civil? But, um, and then the, the interviews were um, more laid back than I thought they were for um, law firms. You know, the, you um, come out to DC and you'll interview with the office that um, has chosen you for an interview. And um, you'll, you know, you'll meet for an hour or so with someone in the office just to talk about what the job is like. And um, after the interviews, then they decide who is progressing to final round. Um, and it's not final round interviews, but at that point they'll probably call you and, you know, gauge what your interest is in the office. And then they make um, final hiring after at that point. And um, they are um, very competitive positions, but, you know, as Ashley mentioned, I did not go to a highly ranked law school. I love my law school, but, you know, Chicago Kent isn't Yale or Harvard and, or, or, you know, California, Berkeley, but I, you know, got good grades and, and worked for the DOJ and, and that, you know, was the interest that they wanted to see in the office. So, you know, don't, don't shy away from the DOJ just because you didn't go to a highly ranked law school or anything like that. Um, but yeah, that was that was my route. So I've, this is this is the only um, you know law practice I've done. I've only worked for the DOJ after clerking, and it's the best job ever. <laughs> I can confirm. So Annie, how did you manage studying for the bar and also working for the DOJ through the SLIP program? Um, I actually, it's, I'm going to sound crazy for saying this, but I actually found it easier to work and study for the bar only because it, it um, forces you to be self-disciplined. You know, I would work until about five and then I'd come home and eat dinner and then I'd study from about six to 11. Um, and then I'd go to bed and I'd, you know, wake up and do it over again. And it was enough time. Um, it, I thought it was better. I was able to just sit down and focus for that five hours instead of a lot of my friends who, you know, what's that saying that you're naturally going to work as much time as you're given um, you know, they would sit around all day studying for the bar and feel very sick of it or overwhelmed by it, but I was able to kind of sit down and focus. So that's, it's definitely doable, though I know they don't recommend it. So you'll have to kind of determine what's best for you. And then one more question, Annie. You had mentioned that you didn't have any prior work experience before coming to DOJ. I think it was your third month in the DOJ, maybe fourth, and I got to watch you argue at the federal circuit before a three-judge panel. So for those law students who are interested in coming over to DOJ but might feel nervous at the workload or opportunities that you're given when you work at DOJ, can you provide any insight about how you've prepared yourself to take on work that is you know, typically done by people with far more experience than you? Yeah, um, well, I think there's two two ways to think about that. I, I did try, you know, in law school, I did try to, to prepare myself the best way I could. I did, I did join the trial team, and I, I competed, so I kind of got a little comfortable with my oral advocacy skills. You know, a lot of people do moot court, something like that. Um, and then I interned a lot in law school. I interned for a federal judge, um, like I said, with the DOJ, and then with a state judge. So I kind of got comfortable um with federal motions practice, how to research and write, what, you know, motions to dismiss look like and those kind of things. I felt like I was familiar with 
kinds of federal litigation practice because I knew I wanted to litigate. And then um, coming to the DOT with no prior litigation experience, um, it hasn't been a problem. The, the DOJ is referred to as the biggest, well, the civil division at least, is referred to as the biggest law firm in the world because we are. Um, and we have a lot of resources, which is not to say we have a lot of money, but we have Every single lawsuit has an agency that's involved who has a lawyer that the agency has. So when you get a case assigned to you, there's already, you know, a lot of people that have already been working on this issue for a long time. So you have a lot of support from your agency. You have a lot of support from all the other amazing attorneys in your office who've already done this. So I've always felt um, very supported um, and that I'm just as good as any attorney that, you know, I'm going up against. I'm usually going up against people that are sometimes twice my age. Um, and I've never felt like I'm, you know, insufficient. The, the office helps you tremendously. Um, we have a moot process every single time we argue. We argue in front of our bosses. If it's a federal circuit panel, we argue twice in front of our bosses. So you're very prepared. They set you up for success. It's not like they throw you out there and say good luck. So I feel like, you know, they've really prepared me to be a great litigator in the future in the short two years that I've been here and I can't wait to, to learn more. Great. So I think that a lot of law students um, are thinking about going the DOJ route through the honors program versus the private practice. And I think that they would be interested in hearing the difference between the two. So we have both Nick and Phil who have worked um, for the private sector and the, now the public sector. Bill, you had mentioned the crazy law firm hours. Can you speak to the difference between your work life at a big law firm in Washington, D.C. Um, and now at the Department of Justice? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think if, if, if folks are operating under the assumption that, that it's cushy to be at the government, at DOJ in particular, um, versus at a firm, uh, being a lot cushier in the government, I think they would probably be disappointed. Um, but what there are some obvious um, differences. I mean, for example, we don't have to bill our hours, at least in the same level of granularity uh, that, that you would in the private practice where you might have to be uh, narrowing it down to, you know, six, like six minutes of time and, and, and keeping very close track to how you spend your time. Um, so that's one of the most uh, important ones, but but two, I think there are a lot of different ways to succeed um, in in a less hierarchical structure at the Department of Justice, um, and I think this would be true regardless of whether you work in, in the front office of one of the components or whether you're a, a trial attorney that came in through the honors program or as a lateral. Um, you know, just the number of opportunities to find a particular niche or to really um, to really thrive and jump on new opportunities as they come in. I think um, is is an exciting part of being at the government. Um, um, you know, I'm trying to give like a good example, but I think one thing that I've noticed among a number of my friends that are in the division is, um, uh, you know, it really pays off to be diligent and to be always eager to volunteer and take on more work. Um, and uh, I think just because you'll probably have a, a, a lower percentage of folks. Um, in the uh, you know in the government that are that are eager to do that because um, uh, you know at law firms everyone sort of is, is kind of progressing up a ladder where they know that the attrition rates are going to continue going up year by year. Not everyone is going to be able to make it to to being a partner, um, and so in the firm environment there are the incentives to to work as much as you possibly can and while while obviously continuing to do a great job. Uh, the same incentive isn't necessarily there um, in the government, but you know. So if if folks bring the sort of enterprising, you know, I'm willing to work around the clock if I need to for on a particular matter, then I'm happy to do it. Uh, with, with folks who come into the to the government with that mentality, then they can find some tremendous opportunities and and really excel. That's not that's not what you have to do to excel, but um, if people come to government with the mentality that they're willing to do whatever it takes to, you know, to advance the department's mission, uh, then I see that attitude being and, and uh, eagerness being uh, rewarded all the time. And then, Nick, could you also speak to any distinctions or differences between working at a boutique law firm and getting a lot of on-your-feet trial experience versus where you are in the AUSA office now? 
or USA office? Sure. I, I think, yeah, w one of the biggest um, differences, I think, um, is obviously the 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 management structure. I, I'm a I'm somebody who actually does pretty well with um, a, a clear structure uh, in management and, you know, being told what to do. And, and I think that's much better than in a boutique law firm where you're just running around half the day um, trying to do stuff for other people. Um, just to to kind of piggyback um, on what to, what Bill was saying, though, I think the the opportunities um, in DOJ are really really limitless uh, in terms of what you're able to do. Uh, when I got down to Puerto Rico six years ago, I had never even been in an appellate courtroom, and uh, I asked to do an oral argument, and I've done three now in front of the First Circuit, both in Boston and here. And it, it's a really just a matter of, of asking um, and speaking up, and you can you have the opportunity to, to reinvent yourself um, within the department. And I think the second biggest difference is that I've found, you know, the, it's it's very rewarding to do this job, and it can be rewarding, I'm sure, to do private practice. I think the difference is that your your management, and especially when you get really high up in management, they understand that you're doing this. Um, that you're in civil service because you enjoy it. And I think they, there's a lot of gratitude from the top down um, to, to what we're doing, what our mission is. Um, everybody, you know, we work as, as, as hard sometimes as, um, as our private sector, um, you know, opponents. Certainly, I think we work as hard. And I just think that there's a lot more gratitude uh, that comes from the top about what you're doing, um, which makes up for the, you know, the, the paycheck being lower. But, um uh, I've always found that to be kind of something that that I thrive with, which is is people understanding that we're just doing this uh, not for for the glory, but it's it's because we want to serve our, uh, you know our department and our country. Colleen, can you speak to how your if if this did in fact happen, how your um, previous background as a child abuse and sex crime state prosecutor helped you? Um, get a job with the DOJ, or do you attribute you getting that job um, for something else? No, I would not have gotten the job if I hadn't been a sex crimes and child abuse prosecutor. Um, I do want to say that that and um, you know, boutique private firms can probably give a lot of trial experience. If you want to get trial experience right out of law school, um, going straight to a prosecutor's office, a defense side office, a family um, uh, law office, housing, um, those will get you into court faster than anything. So uh, one year out of law school, I was holding a caseload of 280 cases, um, and I was in court every single day. Um, and that's an experience that's hard to get, I've heard, in most private practice and also in the federal government caveat being the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C., which handles um, uh, D.C.'s uh, uh, criminal code um, also, which is akin to a state's uh, um, a state uh, uh, district attorney or state's attorney's office. Um, but my experience in the state's uh, county attorney's office um, doing sex crimes and child abuse and having trial experience is why I got the job. Um, when I applied to the Civil Rights Division, they were looking with, for someone who had experience handling sexual assault and child abuse. We do a lot of sexual harassment cases in my line of work, um, and we work with victims of sexual harassment, so they wanted someone who had that experience. And because trial work is actually quite rare in the Civil Rights Division, um, it, cases very rarely go to trial. Not many people had trial experience, and so they were looking for someone who had had experience with trial and also had experience with working with um, individuals who had been impacted by abuse and sexual assault. And I had both those experiences from my prosecutor's background, um, which uh, they literally asked me the question, can you tell us about your last in-court experience? And I said, I'm in court every single day. Are you asking about my last trial experience or what I said to the judge today? And they were like, oh. And it wasn't until I got to the Civil Rights Division that I found out that I would go from being in court every single day to being in court you know, a handful of times a year. They just didn't have the level of experience I did as a prosecutor. 
That's great. So let's go ahead and shift gears a little bit and talk about what each of you do actually on the day to day. Um, Annie, do you want to start us off and tell us what it means to be a trial attorney in the civil division um, with the caveat, like I believe Colleen said earlier, that trial attorneys in all the different sections of DOJ vary significantly um, depending on which section you're in. But Annie, do you want to give us an overview of your work? Sure. So um, I work, um, I actually, I, I work with Ashley. We're in the same office. So I work for the um, commercial litigation branch. And then within the commercial litigation branch, I work in the national courts section. Um, commercial litigation, I believe, is divided up into the fraud section, the foreign litigation section, um, the national courts section, and um, IP section. And then there's one more that I'm forgetting, Ashley. Um, but does oh, corporate, <laughs> corporate and financial. Yeah, corporate and financial. Um, Bankruptcy is formidable. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so our office in particular, we're a very, very heavy litigating office. Um, we handle um, any lawsuit, basically any lawsuit for money against the government um, in three primary courts. So we litigate in the Court of Federal Claims out here in Washington, D.C., uh, the Court of International Trade in New York, and then the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, which is the appeals, cur the appeals court for both the Court of International Trade and the Court of Federal Claims. The Court of Federal Claims has jurisdiction over um, any claim for money damages against the government. Um, and so um, if, if there's a lawsuit in the United States for over $10,000 for breach of contract, there's other exceptions in tort and things, but... Um, that has to be filed in the Court of Federal Claims. Um, so we handle breach of contract, um, cases involving um, federal benefits, like a veteran who sues for benefits, or um, if, a, if an employee is fired um, and they sue to get reinstated, or for damages for being you know, um, improperly fired or demoted. Um, we handle, like I said, lawsuits in the Court of International Trade, which are um, usually lawsuits brought by importers or domestic um, companies suing um, over tariffs that the Department of Commerce imposes on various products. Um, and then at the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, um, we actually handle some lawsuits that go directly to the Federal Circuit, so from administrative boards. If any of you take administrative law, you'll learn that there's a lot of um, government boards out there and um, so once the board makes a decision um, for example against the veteran saying they're not entitled to benefits the veteran then has the right to sue in um, the federal circuit and then the Department of Justice will get involved so our office handles um, a wide array of lawsuits we also do Fifth Amendment takings cases so um, it's a very diverse practice most of us in the office consider ourselves generalists um, none of my lawsuits are, are very similar to one another. Um, and uh, what it means like day to day, um, you know, we'll get, we'll get assigned a case. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, um, our client, you know, is usually an agency that's being sued, you know, like when the Department of the Army enters into a contract or when the Department of Commerce is sued for a tariff that they impose. So we're defending an agency. Um, so, um, the agency and I will start to communicate and they'll tell me, you know, about the case, what it's about, and I'll kind of start, my, you know, initial role in the case is to determine is there any reason to file a motion to dismiss or some dispositive motion right out of the gate? Is there a reason that jurisdiction is lacking? Um, if you don't like civil procedure, but you want to get involved in the federal government, you should start liking civil procedure. <laughs> I hate to say it, but it's a very important <laughs> part of federal practice. <laughs> Um, and so we you know, are drafting a lot of positive motions, so it's a heavy brief writing practice. Um, and then we go to court and we argue. Uh, the court told oral argument over, you know, the majority of dispositive motions. So since I started two years ago, I've had eight um, arguments in federal court. Um, I have another one on Friday, Court of International Trade. It's virtual, but um, so you get, you get in court fairly often for a civil litigator. Um, you, you completely manage your own cases right off the bat, which is very great. I, you know, I'm very autonomous. Um, but, you know, Ashley has been in the office a year longer than me, so I'm often relying on her for help or resources or other people in the office. Um, that's kind of how, how my job is as, 
as a trial attorney for the DOJ. It's, it's very independent. You're you're going to court um, a lot. You're handling your own case, and it's very interesting. And you're learning about new areas of law all of the time, which I think is very. It keeps it interesting. So uh, I I love it. I think it's it's litigating is is really exciting when you do it for the Department of Justice. Thanks, Sandy. Bill, let's go to you next. Um, I'm sure law students and myself also are very interested in learning what a chief of staff does and what it actually means to advise a political appointee like the assistant attorney general. Yeah, so, um, and, and to be honest, when I came in, I didn't have a strong idea of what it would look like myself. But, um, you know, I would break it down, and it probably the chief staff job is really going to depend a lot on who the the head of the component is. I mean, there's a way that one could do it, in, you know, kind of almost in this administrative role, a managerial role. I mean, it's just the amount of processes internally that that need oversight is just extraordinary. But um, you know, I've been fortunate to maybe I just delegate aggressively. I would say that only takes up like a third or maybe like a third or a quarter of my actual time on a day to day. Um, and then the rest of it, you know, I'll probably break it down in two ways. One is I help oversee the civil, criminal, and policy-related matters that are working their way up through the investigation and development phases. Um, and those, for everything, it, it, it ends up making it to the front office for a decision. And, um, you know, every enforcement action in the IHS division is imbued with significant policy ramifications, not just like, you know, go after this company, go after that company, but more in the, in the sense of, you know, making, a, making an enforcement decision is based on facts where um, it's going to, where the, the outer edges of antitrust law are very nebulous. And, um, you know, there are questions about, you know, is this enforcement action going to be something which is in the in the outer edges? Is it going to be right in the core of, of what we've done before? And um, or, so it's, it's, it's thinking those through and then weighing the relative risks and of, of doing that. Um, and so a lot of it is advising. I mean, we start every day for with about an hour long meeting with the head of the antitrust division, me and him and about five others, um, to go through everything either that day or that week, which is going to be um, up for a decision and, and a final decision point, and a lot of times we'll have a staff presentation, outside attorneys coming in, putting in their best argument for why we shouldn't sue them, for example. And um, and those decisions are incredibly difficult, and, and uh, they're high-risk decisions, and they can have significant ramifications in the economy. Um, so that's a part of it. I guess I would say as the other part of the job, um, one of my roles is to help advance the affirmative agenda of the head of the division. Um, and that, in some ways, is, is, is policy focused, but it, help, it includes helping launch new strategic initiatives, um, revising our practices and guidelines, um, and a lot of public advocacy. Um, every t I've drafted probably dozens of speeches at this point for the head of the division. I've given some speeches myself. I've appeared on a couple dozen panels. Uh, you know, things like that, but talking about so the, the cutting edge and frontier work that we do. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I also deal with, with the press a lot. I mean, you have to know when, when you're work with the head of the division um, at an appearance after which he's going to get mobbed by reporters, you, you, you need to figure out which ones you can trust and which ones you can't. You need to keep an eye out for the people who are the arbitrage uh, folks who are sending research updates to their clients. They probably have these you know, tape recorders in their hands trying to figure out if any particular word that comes out of his mouth is going to be something that will move markets. And, you, you know, you kind of have to put yourself in between them and your boss. Um, so there are a lot of kind of crazy experiences that um, in some ways are a little surreal that you have to go through um, knowing that you have to be the eyes and ears and, and uh, you know, in, on, on both shoulders of the AAG throughout um, throughout all the decisions he has to make. Uh, it can be overwhelming, but it, it can be a lot of fun. I mean, there, there are no two days that are the same, and it's very fast-paced, um, but it's been incredibly rewarding. Great. Colleen, we often think of civil rights issues operating on a local or a, a state level. Can you give us more info on how the Department of Justice gets involved um, in education issues and how your day to day functions? Sure. So, um, 
the, the history of the department goes back farther than 1964. Um, it, it actually goes back, the civil rights, sorry, the division. But, uh, but uh, an impetus for a lot of the work that the Civil Rights Division of DOJ does was the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which came in response to Brown versus Board of Education and the Jim Crow laws. And um, it, it's a Civil Rights Act that moved to desegregate um, and address discrimination in a lot of different areas. And one of the, the sections explicitly addresses education, uh, segregation and desegregation in um, public schools, including K-12 and colleges and universities. So a lot of our work um, stems out of uh, the Civil Rights Act, but there are other um, Civil Rights Acts that apply to, or civil laws, civil rights laws, that apply, apply to schools, including Title IX, um, uh, which is a, a a anti-sex discrimination um, in Education Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. So what the Civil Rights Division does in the Educational Opportunity section where I work is we do affirmative enforcement of these federal civil rights laws, um, which guarantees um, certain rights, whether it's uh, the right to be to go to school free of sex-based discrimination, race-based discrimination, religious discrimination, national origin discrimination, disability discrimination, or um, the Equal, Equal Education Opportunities Act uh, requires that schools provide equal education opportunity for English language learners. Um, we enforce all of these. So usually um, that ca we get a complaint from someone, a parent, a student, uh, the local U.S. Attorney's Office uh, got it from the community saying my school or this university is discriminating against me on the basis of a protected class. And we spend majority of our time investigating those claims. So we uh, ask for information from the schools, we conduct site visits, we interview community members, we interview administrators from the schools, we review tens of thousands of pages of documents, and at the end of it, uh, we determine whether or not uh, the allegations and the evidence that support the allegations meet uh, the definition of, of discrimination or um, denial of equal educational opportunity as um, interpreted by the courts. So, so my day-to-day -day is very heavy investigative work. Um, but because we do federal civil rights laws, at any point during the day, other things can happen. Um, we are often asked to review um, other agencies like the Department of Education and Department of Health and Human Services regulations that are about to be uh, released or have been released. We're asked to review um, legislation that's going before Congress to talk about any concerns that it might not um, comply with federal civil rights laws or create tensions. Um, we are asked to sit on panels, uh, either for the education community or sometimes for um, uh, local communities. Um, we're asked to do trainings um, for uh, assistant, unit, uh, assistant U.S. attorneys around the country who partner with us on this work. So we'll do trainings on our statutes. We'll do trainings on how to do investigations. So any day is a hybrid of working your own investigative cases and assisting in reviews of uh, any policy work that's coming out and working on trainings and teaching people on how to effectively enforce federal civil rights laws. All right, and then Nick, you are perhaps the most successful of any of us because you've figured out how to work for DOJ and also live on an island. So can you give us um, some insight into what it's like to be an AUSA and since you've also worked as an AUSA in DC, um, if there's any distinctions between working in one geographic area versus another, what that's like? Um, yeah, sure. I think the first thing that is, is interesting is, is I think Colleen mentioned that that DC, the DC office, also is responsible for prosecuting local crimes there in the district. So it, it's 
kind of interesting I ended up in Puerto Rico because the role of the U.S. Attorney's Office down here is much, um, it, it's greater than it is in most typical jurisdictions because we have a state um, system that has um, some some severe challenges in terms of, um, uh, you know, re really a resource, resource challenges in terms of prosecuting cases. So we will take, um, you know, a, a large amount of cases that other offices uh, would not take um, if we can assert federal jurisdiction just for the interest of the safety of this community. Um, I, you know, I think there are a lot of differences and a lot of similarities um, between uh, offices. Every, you know, every office is going to have its own community and its own um, citizens that they're uh, responsible for. Um, in my case now, you know, we I run our child exploitation uh, division, and, and those are largely uh, fairly similar. I think one of the one of the greatest things uh, working for DOJ is that you know we have access not only to everybody in our office and all the experience that you can find within your own office, but the whole DOJ community all across the country. And if there's an issue that you have in one of your cases um, that you is important you haven't seen it before, you get on the, the, the listserv for our child exploitation project, Safe Childhood, and, and we, we have access to, you know, 500 trial attorneys um, across the nation. And uh, inevitably, somebody has uh, dealt with what you're dealing with, or if they haven't, they're going to chime in and, and give you their thoughts and ideas. So, you know, it, while I, I work in a different office, the, the network of U.S. attorney's offices within uh, the department is really accessible, um, and I think, you know, as as we've all seen with uh, with COVID nineteen and the pandemic, um, it's important to have uh, this kind of remote access uh, to individuals, and it's been it's been great for us. Um, our section, a lot of uh, sections haven't been as busy during this time, and ours because we're doing online child exploitation um, has been we've been extremely busy because um, people are home, and so. Um, I've found that, that the the access to to DOJ across the country has really been one of the one of the great parts of of our job is being able to, to communicate and work with them. And I, could you talk a little bit about um, transferring from one United States Attorney's Office to the other? We have a question from one of the law students, but I think we can make it a little broader. Do you think that it's easier or better to sort of get your foot in the door where you can, given that job opportunities are limited, and then try to transfer to maybe your first choice that wasn't initially open, or maybe you didn't have enough experience to begin with? Or do you think that it's just as easy to get a job in the Department of Justice um, as if you were coming from a law firm or another job as opposed to coming from internally? I, I mean, I think the answer is it really depends. Um, I would say, though, if you have an interest in being in the department, get in where you can. I, I think that that advice, uh, whether it be a, spe a special uh, assistant U.S. attorney um, or through the honors program or through direct hire, if you want to be in the department, the ability to move around in the department once you are once you're there, I think is a little bit easier. Um, for one reason. Uh, I mean, it, it might be better for you is that when you transfer between uh, a U.S. Attorney's Office or between a U.S. Attorney's Office to Maine Justice or from Maine Justice to U.S. Attorney's Office, you can keep all your leave. You're in the system. The transfer doesn't cost the department money for background checks. There's a lot of kind of logistical things that make it easy um, for department employees to transfer within a department. Um, and it's encouraged, obviously, uh, amongst the, the offices and, and the the criminal division because we're, we're spending resources to train uh, our personnel and if we can keep them, uh, we want to do that. So I, I think that if you have an opportunity to get in uh, and it may, whether or not it's the office of your dreams, um, do it and then you can always uh, keep an eye out. Uh, just as a practical point, I never intended to live in the middle of the Caribbean um, and it just was one of those opportunities that presented itself and I was going to be here for three years and move back to my hometown in D.C. And six years later, it's here and we have a baby. And, you know, um, so I just wanted to mention that in terms of, you know, you can only plan so far ahead. 
Um, and the department has given me great opportunities to work with members of the uh, main justice and, and the computer crime and intellectual property section, human trafficking prosecutions unit, which we work very closely with because of our uh, position geographically. So there's a lot of opportunities no matter where you go, and I had no idea that, that being down here would present as many opportunities as it has. So uh, get in if you want to get in and uh, just see where the rest takes you. Can I follow up with Colleen, Colleen actually? That can I just say that that absolutely get in. Some of the divisions, like civil rights division, actually have what's called open season. So if you've been in a section for a couple of years, you can apply to transfer. But I would just encourage anyone: don't apply for something you absolutely don't want to do, because you don't know you're guaranteed to move somewhere within a couple of years, and you might end up spending many years being miserable. So. I absolutely agree. Get in where you can get in, but just make sure it's something that you want to be doing. Um, you know, if you only want to do criminal work and you enter in the civil side, you might be miserable, or vice versa. Um, so I'm going to give that one caveat. I think you would agree, Nick, right? Oh yeah, 100. percent I mean, you don't want to be unhappy either. That's no fun. Um, I, I just I think if it's a regional thing, the U.S. Attorney's offices are, um, you know, largely going to going to give you. Uh, similar enough experience that you can translate it to, to where you want to be. But yeah, I totally agree. And if you're at Maine Justice, do you have opportunities to work outside of Washington, D.C.? Uh, Colleen, do you want to address that first and then we can circulate to others? Um, well, all of our practice is outside of Washington, D.C. So we enforce federal civil rights laws throughout the country. Um, and almost, I've had one you, case in D.C. and almost. Excuse me? Sorry, I should clarify. Um, living outside of D.C., are you permitted to do that since you practice all over the country? We have to be geographically located near the office because we have requirements inside of the office. Um, I don't know. I know of some exceptions to that. Um, but it's usually people have been here for a few years. So if you want to work for Maine Justice, at least Civil Rights Division I can speak for, and you live in Walla Walla, Washington, um, they probably would require you to transfer over, although I do know people who after a number of years have been able to move to the other side of the country from D.C. and maintain their jobs. Um, so it's best, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer uh, strongly to Nick here, but if you want to work for the Department of Justice and stay regional outside of um, uh, D.C. area, I would suggest strongly to apply to the U.S. Attorney's offices. Um, if you want to work in the D.C. region, you can apply to Maine Justice. You will spend a lot of your time traveling in many of the sections and divisions because um, we enforce nationwide the work that we do. But I don't know, in Civil Rights Division, they make you live in the D.C. region, even though we practice throughout the country. Great. Um, Annie, we have a few follow-up questions on the honors program. Do you have any advice for law students who perhaps don't have the best grades right now, but are really interested in applying for the honors program, other ways that they can make themselves stand out? Yeah, um, I do think the best way is to try to get out to Washington, D.C. Um, like I said, I had a lot of success through the volunteer internship um, application process. At that point, there wasn't a lot that I could set myself apart in. I only had um, one year worth of grades. Um, but there are, like I said, there's opportunities um, for the DOJ at AOSA offices all over the country. Um, I know the tax division is located at a few, there's a few offices around the country. So if, if you're worried about your grades, I think the way you can stick out is one, um, trying to intern at the DOJ. Um, and then also just getting work experience with the federal government so you kind of understand um, how federal practice works. Um, I felt uh, more prepared in interviews because I had a lot to talk about. I could talk about my internship with a federal judge um, and how I really enjoyed motions practice and learning how federal court procedure works and, and working on 
um, issues of federal law, you know, kind of demonstrating that interest in federal law. And then um, developing your research and writing skills. If you can't get on your, um, you know, your school's law review or the, the main law journal, that doesn't mean you can't join another journal um, that your school offers. My school offered a, a lot of journals. And then if you want to litigate, trying to get on either moot court or trial team. Like I said, I wasn't on moot court. I know that's typically the more prestigious one, but I was on trial team because I knew I wanted to do trial practice. So, um, and that was, that was fine. So I think just the way you can develop your interest in both the DOJ and federal practice will both be um, very useful if you're worried about your grades. Thanks, Danny. If I could add to that. Few... Yeah. Hey, I, yeah, I just want to, this is Nick. I wanted to add one thing to that. I, and I know this because it, it, just transferring districts in D.C., we have a very robust student intern program at the U.S. Attorney's Office there. But I know from my experience down here that not all of your U.S. Attorney's Offices are going to be advertising for summer internships. And it's worthwhile just to put your resume together, send it to their HR director uh, in that district at, to the U.S. Attorney's Office and see if they're hiring for summer internships because um, I, I've tried to create a new program for us down here and we've tripled our amount of applications just because we didn't have a formal program. And so I think there may be offices, especially smaller U.S. Attorney's Offices, who um, may bring on summer interns but they're not advertising it um, as well as, as they should. And so I would just, if you have a, you want to be somewhere regionally and just put your resume together and, and put a cover letter together and tell them that you're interested in, in a summer internship that might help you um, kind of uh, add to your resume for the honors program. It's Colleen. Can I add something else? We in Civil Rights Division have something yeah. called law clerks. So a lot of people will apply um, after they've graduated from law school, whether they apply for the honors program, which sometimes can be very limited. Um, I think this year we're only taking two people in the Civil Rights Division. So, you know, if you want to work for Civil Rights Division and there's only two spaces from the Honors Program, you're going to have a limited ability to move in here. Um, people will take a job as a contract law clerk um, working in our office. And I know a number of people have, have moved on to permanent positions after working as a law clerk, either directly from the position, um, they applied for an opening, or they went somewhere else for a year or two, but we all remembered them and loved their work. When they applied for an open position, they were hired back. Very helpful. So in our last two minutes, um, let's have each of the panelists give one maybe parting piece of advice or wisdom to law students. Uh, Bill, you want to start? Uh, sure. Yeah, um, I, I think this is a, a theme that everyone has probably hit on to some degree already, but you know, one piece of advice that I would give to any law student is be flexible and open to, for, to your career going in a direction that you didn't really expect it to go. Um, I think this is especially true of folks who, who live and work in the Washington, D.C. area, um, just given how many, especially if you have an interest in government, just given how many different federal agencies there are, um, and such a broad legal community it is. But I think it also holds true even if you're not in D.C. I mean, as your career progresses, um, you will be attracted to new, different, and interesting areas of the law, whether it's because you love working with a particular people or there's something about the practice you had no idea that you would really enjoy until you started working on it. So being open-minded to your career and, and letting your career go where you can really excel is, I think is one of the most important things to do and being prepared to, to, to go in a direction that isn't what you necessarily thought that you would be doing all throughout law school. Thanks. Nick, you want to chime in? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I completely agree with everything Bill said uh, and I would make that my own. That was well, that was well said and just I want to add one thing from a practical perspective when you are interviewing for whatever job you have, whatever job you're interviewing for, whether it be an internship or entry-level position, attorney position, research that office as much as you can prior to your interview because I find it shocking, and I'm on our hiring committee, that we'll interview people for assistant United States attorney's positions, and they really have never even been to our website. And it's just important because it shows that you are really interested. 
and this is kind of really has nothing to do with the Department of Justice. It could be private practice. You should know what that place is doing, how they're operating, what some of their most recent cases and successes are, um, because I think that that separates people immediately during our interview process. So that's all I got. Colleen? Well, um, they took what I would say, but I'll say something else. Uh, evidently, there's been a study that says for you to be happy at work, um, you need to do something you're good at and be surrounded by people that you like and like you. So I'm just going to encourage you as you go out um, to think about what you're good at during law school. Are you good at oral argument? Are you good at writing? Are you good at think these, you know, what are you good at? Uh, and pursue that. And then also, when you're interviewing, it's very hard, I think, for law students. They're trying to get a job. They're thinking, I need to get a job. But remember to ask yourself the question, do I see myself working with these people day in and day out? Um, because happiness at work is multifaceted, and you want to make sure you fit into the right place. Also, everything the guys said before me. Annie? Yeah. Um just building off of kind of what everyone said, I think um, coming out of law school, it um, especially if you're looking to work for the federal government, you should, I think the best way to view yourself is kind of like a blank slate and that, you know, you're malleable. Um, I, I didn't have any um, commercial litigation experience. I definitely didn't have any international trade experience. And I didn't have any appellate experience. And now I do all of those things. Um, and I think the reason my office hired me, um, well, I know this, I've now talked to the people who, you know, interviewed me and liked me. They just said that, you know, I, I came in excited to learn. I, I knew what skills I wanted to use. So that was what I focused on in my interview. I knew that I wanted to litigate. I wanted to do discovery. I wanted to go to trial. I wanted to argue. Um, and so I focused on those broader skills and, I was excited to learn from other people. I was excited to, um, you know, kind of grow into a role because obviously the DOJ really cares about somebody who's going to come in and, you know, learn from their peers, learn, because, I mean, the best attorneys work for the government. I, I really think they do. And um, so I, I think it, it's helpful if you go into an interview, you know, emphasizing that, that, you know, you are new and that's okay. It's not you know, all of us were law students at one point, but, you know, just emphasize that you're excited to learn and you're ready to, you know, get out there and practice, but focusing more on the broader skills, kind of like, you know, Bill talked about just being open to um, different practice areas or um, different ways your career could take you, because I never thought I would be where I, where I am now, and I love it. Great. So I think that we've learned there is a lot of opportunities, a lot of routes that you can take within justice. Everyone, myself included, agrees that DOJ is an awesome place to work. So we really encourage all of you listening to consider it as you're making your way through law school. Um, join the FBA, and I think that is it. Great. Laura, Thank you so much, else? Ashley. And to the sure, yeah. Thank you to all of our presenters. Um, we learned a lot today, and it was great having you. Thank you to our attendees, and we hope that you join the next session in our law student series, um, the Judge Advocate Panel, which is Monday, July 27th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Active duty judge advocates from each of the branches of the military will discuss what it's like to be a lawyer um, in the JAG Corps, how to join, and where to go if you um, return to civilian life. Um, so join us then and be sure to take the survey at the end of the presentation. Thank you, everyone.